Let me tell you something. We are living in interesting times for many reasons. We are living in times of skepticism, right? So the idea of, you know, uh, religion being an outdated pre-modern thing is very common now. It's, it's, the, it's the common atmosphere in high school. It's certainly the common atmosphere in the university setting. So it doesn't matter if you're going in the accounting field or you're going to go into medicine, if you're Pakistani, uh, or if you're going to go, you know, whatever field you're going to go into, you're going to take a couple of years of electives. Okay, and those electives, the idea of them is to instill enough in you enough doubt, enough ideas, you know, from the point of view of anthropology to, you know, psychology to philosophy. You get into, exposed to enough ideas that are, they're more than enough to sh shatter or at least, at the very least, rattle your foundations in your faith. They're there to mess you up. And especially if you go further in your studies, some, some students decide they're gonna go further in their studies in the humanities. So they're gonna study, you know, uh, sociology of religion or anthropology or something like that. May Allah protect them because most of the people who end up in these fields become highly agnostic or highly skeptic of religion. You know, because they look at it, because you know, in the academia, they study religion like, much like they're studying a corpse. It's something dead and they're doing an autopsy. It's a soulless study of religion. They call it Islamic studies programs in many universities. It's anything but, you know. It's this, it's this idea of just studying this thing. That's very, it, their, their approach to it is no different from the department next door that's studying cadavers. It's honest to God. That's, it's, it is what it is. That, that is how it is. Now we're in that environment and we're in that culture and those ideas are not only relegated to academia anymore, they have made their way into YouTube. They have made their way into popular media, right? So we're exposed to that line of thinking overwhelmingly, all the time. I wanna summarize the problem of modern thought in four, four ways. I think this is important for this conversation, especially when we're talking about giving faith to our children and passing the legacy of faith and prayer down to our kids then I think this is important. Uh, and if you've heard this from me before, I apologize. Oh, actually, no, I don't apologize. Uh, you need to hear it again. So, uh, so here goes. In, in pre-modern society, it doesn't matter if they're Muslim or not, pre-modern society uh, put God at the center. So whether it was Hindu society, or it was Christian society, or Jewish society, pre-modern societies put some higher power at the center, okay? And people who understood that higher power or studied that higher power or worshipped that higher power were the most important people in that society. So in, in Hindu society, the people who were the most re the religious, you know, uh, uh, pundits or whatever they are, they were actually of the, the elite of that society. In Islamic tradition, the ulama were the elite of the society. They were the most noble, most respected of the people. In, in the Catholic tradition or in the Christian tradition, the people that studied Catholicism, they were actually very noble. They were the noble class of people. Right? So the, the study of God was the most important study. The second most important study, I'm going to go in order now, three things at least. The second most important study was actually the study or the, the a focus on an afterlife. And it's not limited to Islam. Everybody talked about either whether they talk about karma or they talk about heaven and hell or they talk about something. But there's a constant emphasis on an afterlife. Do we have that emphasis in Islam? Absolutely. Every, everything you do, there are consequences and benefits of it in the Akhirah. So there was a focus on God and there was a focus on the afterlife. And then thirdly, after God and the afterlife, there was a focus on bettering yourself morally, bettering yourself spiritually, saving your soul, I like to call it. Every culture has something about saving your soul. The Christians talk about saving the soul, you know. The, the Buddhists talk about it in one way, in, one, in so many words. The Muslims, we talk about tazkiyatun nafs, cleansing the self, the diseases of the heart, right? So there's an emphasis on, there's a part of me that is inside, that isn't my physical being, there's a spiritual entity inside me, and it needs to be taken care of. So what were the three areas of emphasis thus far? God, what else? Afterlife, and you could just say the soul. God, the afterlife, and... The soul. And then finally, as a result of all of these, actually I'll hold off to finally. Let me tell you what happened in postmodern society. Postmodern society, the, the revolution in Europe, basically leads to many, many different kinds of philosophies because philosophy was outlawed in Europe. But after the revolution against the church, there was an explosion of philosophies in Europe. And there were so many different, so many isms, right? All, diff all different kinds of isms. 
But at the end of the day, all of those isms had a few things in common. And I want to share those with you. They said that we've been studying God throughout history. What has that given us? An oppressive regime? What does that produce? Has that produced a better world? But even now that we have an opportunity to explore the universe, understand matter, develop physics and chemistry, you know, understand mechanics. When we study these things, we see immediate benefits. You know the industrial revolution in Europe? is not because people studied God, but it's actually because people studied the universe. So we've been studying God a long time, but nothing really happened. But when we study the universe, what happens? Great development. You see fantastic results. So you know what? Whether you want to believe in God or not, it's okay. But the real important thing is to study the universe. So there's a shift in focus. Now the emphasis is on studying the material sciences. And that, that shift that started with the European Revolution is so powerful that you, when you decide to study something that is immaterial, for example, if you decide to leave architecture and go into doing a major in history, your parents will say, what are you doing? You have to get a real job. And most, the most prestigious jobs today, the most prestigious positions today are people that hold positions in a particular science. Is it true or not? So there's a shift, cultural shift. And this is, is this a shift only in Europe and America? No, it's a global phenomenon. So there's this overwhelming emphasis on science, on the universe. What was the second thing that pre-modern society used to emphasize? The afterlife. We've been thinking about heaven and hell. What has that done for us? Well, you know, we need, to make, we need to figure out how to make this life and this society and this world and this city and this country better. We need to advance our study of urban development and architecture and sociology and political science and even psychology. Let's make this life better. And when they emphasize this, were they able to develop? Was Western civilization able to develop more amenities, more advanced political structures, more advanced infrastructure than humanity has ever seen? Absolutely. The study of science, we are beneficiaries of it. The fact that I'm using this microphone and there are cameras recording us and you can watch this on YouTube, this is because of the, the emphasis on scientific discovery. The fact that we took highways here, you know, the, the, the kind of infrastructure, people come from Pakistan, <laughs> you know? Why do people love coming here? Why do people love going to Europe? Especially when they come from the Muslim world. Because in the Muslim world, the way we used to park our, our cows and our camels back in the day is still how we park our cars. <laughs> you know. And just like the camel moves around later, they don't even put the brake on. It's all, it's all good. You know. But we are, we, the world was mesmerized by the infrastructure developed by the West. Absolutely mesmerized. Now that's the second shift. Instead of focusing on the next life, let's focus on this life. What was the third emphasis that used to be there? The soul. Who needs the soul? What has the soul gotten us? Let's study the body. Let's study medicine. Let's study physiology. Let's study neurology. Let's study the, you know, the material part of the human body. is such a universe in and of itself. It's fascinating. Let's make discoveries and breakthroughs in medicine and in the fields of, you know, you know, uh, 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 you know uh, 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 surgery. And research in this, in, this, in this area, and forget spirituality, let's replace spirituality with psychology. And if you're having a problem, there must be some kind of chemical imbalance, we can fix that for you. Take this pill, and you will not want to kill your cousin. You know? So let's... So what happened? A world that used to be emphasized on spiritual truths, God, the afterlife, and the soul, now started emphasizing the universe instead of God, this life instead of the next life, if somebody says, why are you going to study Islam? Well, because I want to, I, I think it's good for my next life. <laughs> get a job. Go study something that will help you get a job now. And somebody says, why are, you, why are you making wudu? Well, you know, it's a means of purification. Praying is, it purifies us. You know, in al-hasanat yudhibna sayyah, you purify. Just use soap. The pure. People started thinking of themselves and the life around them only in material terms. Now let me tell you the last part. This is the reason I brought this up. These, this dichotomy of three versus three. I brought this up. Thank you. That was pretty cool. Okay. So this dichotomy, I tell you why I brought it up. Before pre-modern society, a society based on faith, you have a set of values. And those values are revealed by Allah. They're revealed by a higher power. 
Therefore, they are not subject to change because they're timeless. And if you live by these values, then you will make God happy, then you will better your afterlife, and you will be able to keep your soul pure. How will you do those three things? By abiding by what He revealed. But when the emphasis shifted, when the emphasis shifted, there was no longer a need for God's law or God's advice. Because the things that you will get as a result of following his advice are no longer emphasized. So morality itself became relative. What is good to you, if it feels good, do it. If it doesn't feel good, don't do it. Is the moral compass of the United States, and by extension the world, is the moral compass of the world constantly shifting? What was wrong 30 years ago is okay now. What is wrong today might be okay in five years. The conversation about marijuana went super fast. That went way too fast. The conversation about homosexuality, study it over the last 30 years. Don't even talk about the Islamic perspective. Talk about the American view on homosexuality in the last 30 years. And what do you find? It's remarkable the pace at which the transformation has happened. From its introduction into media to the point where it's celebrated by the President of the United States is pretty remarkable. It's pretty amazing how quickly that happened. Now, because we don't need a constant morality, we need something that is what? Relative. It's, as society changes, we should change alongside with it. What did Salah do? Salah, by the way, we call it Iqamatul Salah, yes? Iqama means when you stand. And when you stand, you don't lean. The values in society have iwaj. This book is qayyim because it, it, it makes you qayyim. It stands up straight. Its values don't budge. Its values don't move. Now that Allah gave us these values, this Qur'an, look at what happens. They wasted the prayer. They let go of the prayer. When you let go of the prayer, the entire moral worldview that comes with the prayer is also gone. When you waste the prayer, that's what that means. So what's the next part? shahawat. They followed desires. <laughs> what have I just summarized to you? What, what, what world are we living in now? The consumer world that we live in now, where the ultimate good is what? Following, obeying your thirst. Just do it. Sound familiar? You know? If it feels right, it must be right. As a matter of fact, in the world of counseling, in the United States, in many, many states now, counselors are not allowed to receive their certifications if they're counseling a young person who comes and says, I have certain thoughts, certain sexual deviations in my mind, I, I have these tendencies, I feel bad about them. You're not allowed to say, yeah, you're right, those are not good feelings you have. You're supposed to say, if it feels right, you should go for it. You can't get your license in counseling if you don't agree. And that's increasing. We're officially becoming a nation of what taba'u shahawat. Follow what the, what the desires, what the shahwa is. Follow desires. You know, recently in Times Square, there was a, you know, Times Square has those giant billboards and the, you know, the, I, I, call, I keep calling it Megatron. It's some bigger, big, not the robot, the big screen, you know. In terms of advertising, they actually advertised a pornography website on Times Square. And the pornography industry, which is one of the most powerful industries in the world, and internet marketers that make millions a month, the vast majority of them are in the pornography industry. Now their next move is, well, if we're going to further this market, we're already making bunches of money, you know, spreading pornography online, but we can further this by making it normal. If we can make it acceptable, and it can, we can put an ad of it next to a Coke, or next to like a McDonald's french fries, it's just a normal thing, it's okay. That's the next step. There are non-Muslim movements right now fight the new addiction. They're seeing it as a problem. But they're only going to see it as a problem for a little bit. It's coming. It's coming. And in many of your offices, and in many of your universities, and in many of your public high schools, when a child or a co-worker has some pornography on their phone, or on their tablet, or even on their screen, nobody cares. It's not a big deal. Or the way they talk is not a big deal. It's not a big... What taba'u shahawat? What, where, where, what was the first downfall? Salat. What taba'u shahawat? And then the final and the worst downfall. Fasawfa yalqawna ghayya. Then they will fall into deviation. 
And ghayi literally means a, a curve or a deviation, which means their values will deviate, and they will deviate more, and they will deviate more, and they will deviate more, until finally the ultimate ghayi, the ultimate deviation, is when they fall into Jahannam. That's why the tafsir of this ayah, they say, Amtarati sama'u nabatan. The sky rained vegetation. The sky does not rain vegetation. The sky rains water, which leads to vegetation. The, he, here it says, they follow deviation. They followed, by the way, al ghayi I know I'm over my time, but that's okay. Inshallah. They'll forgive me. Inshallah. I'm only going to take like two more minutes. I promise. The first meaning of ghayi al dalal wal khayba. Listen to this. The first meaning of ghayi is misguidance. So they're misguided, there's no standard for guidance anymore. And second of all, it is disappointment. So they will follow something and it will not give them pleasure. So they'll follow something else and it won't give them pleasure. And they will constantly be disappointed. Suicide rates will go up. People will live miserable lives. Depression will go up. Anxiety will go up. People will have fancy cars, nice clothes. People have all these things, but they will not be happy. They'll be miserable. They'll be on antidepressants or they will take loads and loads of drugs because they don't want to face reality because they're too disappointed. They're in ghayi. Then al ghayi means al fasad, corruption. Things will get, they're thinking this will make the world a better place. It will become more enjoyable. But the world will become actually only on the surface more enjoyable. The reality of it will be a kind of ugly corruption you can't even imagine. So you will go to places where there are beautiful malls. And there's, you know, the lighting and the design. And you're just going to be like amazed. But the people who work there and work minimum wages are going to be living in subhuman housing. You know, it's going to be facade. It looks pretty. It looks pretty. They're going to sell these clothes in the malls at 200, 300, 2000% profit that are going to be made in factories where people are working like slaves. Even animals shouldn't be treated that way. And if somebody decides to do an investigation on them, well and good. But don't do too much of an investigation because you'll lose, lose your job in Fox or CNN. Facade will come. Corruption will come. Because there's no guidance to keep humanity in check, to keep its greed in check. And the final meaning of ghayi is tarkun nahi. Ash-Sha'arawi rahimahullah argued. He said, ghayi also means the abandonment of prohibition. In other words, there is no such thing as wrong. There is no such thing. It's not, it's, nothing's wrong. When it comes to the bottom line, everything's okay. The, 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 the corporate, soulless corporate industry, Watch these documentaries yourself. Don't oh, listen to me. Watch these. They're not made by Muslim fanatics. You know, they're not made by right wingers. <laughs> you know, they're made by people. Study what happened in the, the Gulf oil spill. Study what happened there. You know, they, there are no prohibitions for them. So long as we can make money, we don't care if we put people's lives in danger. We don't care if we pollute the entire oceans. We don't care. This happens when a useless generation comes up who didn't make prayer. My final comment. Why did I share this dark picture with you? This seems a pretty depressing talk. But, you know, there's another ayah. إِلَّا مَنْ تَابَ وَآمَنَ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا With the exception of those who repented, who, who revived their faith, and the one who did good deeds, who, who acted righteously. فَأُولَٰئِكَ يَدْخُلُونَ الْجَنَّةِ وَلَا يُظْلَمُونَ شَيْئًا They're going to be entering Jannah. They will not be, they will not be, no wrong will be done to them in the least bit. What does Allah do at the end of this ayah? A useless generation came, but even within them, there will be people who can make tawbah. They can fix things. They can go back to how things are supposed to be. So if we, us and our children, are in the danger of falling into khalf, we can become khalaf. We can become khalaf. We, we have to fix this. We have to understand the urgency of the matter today. Communicate with your children. Be in open conversation with your children. Be cognizant and not afraid, not overwhelmed by the evil outside. Learn to raise the kids so they can stand up to that evil. And do the right thing. Stay, the, only, the only hope left for humanity is people who stand up for the, for the word of Allah. The word of Allah did not come to sit in a university or be downloaded on a website. The word of Allah is supposed to live in people's hearts and is communicated to other, other people's hearts. That's the generation we want to raise. And that's the hope that we have, inshallah ta'ala, with institutions like IOK. With efforts that are being made all over. And people can, we can raise people's like, moral compass so that they can go into the executive boardrooms of Shell and IBM or whatever else. IBM's gone, no, who cares about IBM anymore? You know, or Apple. There needs to be moral people in these places. 
Where, where are you going to get moral people from? Right here in this hall. Right here. I pray that Allah Azza wa Jal allows us to rise to the occasion and may Allah not make us of those who are a disappointing next generation. Barakallahu li wa lakum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.